Fora TV. Idea Immersion. Uh, good evening, I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. Uh, this will be the third talk on the singularity. Uh, the first one was Bruce Sterling. Uh, that one was called The Singularity, Your Future is a Black Hole. <laughs> and uh, basically dinged some of the over-enthusiasm uh, from people counting on the singularity like kind of a technological rapture that was going to happen in their lifetime. And then we had uh, Ray Kurzweil, who has basically bet his reputation and career. The singularity is near. And we had an evening called Kurzweil's Law that was very persuasive on the at least so far technological uh, determinism and inevitability of a major transformative and irreversible event happening to humanity uh, in the next few decades. So how amazing to have the guy who started the idea in the first place. And Werner Vinge is a, is a science fiction writer of ideas. I just heard from Peter Schwartz that he actually has an idea box. And out of the box <laughs> comes uh, things like his current book, Rainbow's End, and things like the very early and very influential uh, True Names, which anticipated a whole lot of what cyberspace became. Now, did it anticipate it because it thought about what could happen, or did the people who made cyberspace get influenced by that story? That's the kind of byplay that goes on very often with his kind of, of writing and also his kind of speaking, which we'll hear tonight. Werner Vinge. Thanks, Stuart. It's a very great pleasure to be here and in uh, preparing for this uh, uh, talk. I had the opportunity to uh, uh, go back uh, over the, uh, uh, the, the talks in the series uh, that are already in place, and it's really a marvelous resource uh, uh, that you and the Long Now have uh, put together, and uh, certainly very pleased to hear what Alexander is talking about for the, uh, where, where it's going now. Um, so, my talk here has the title, as you see, What If the Singularity uh, Does Not Happen. Um, just for the record, I should uh, uh, define what I, mean, what I mean by the technological singularity. Um, and that's that it seems to me plausible that with technology, uh, we can, in the fairly near future, create or become creatures that uh, surpass uh, humans. Um, events beyond such an event, which is what I use the term technological singularity for, are as unimaginable to us as opera is to a flatworm. Well, taking that as, to, as being what the uh, uh, idea is, it makes almost by definition uh, discussing, uh, discussing long-term uh, thinking uh, to be an impractical, in, in, impractical thing. And so when Stuart originally suggested that I come and give a talk about the long now, uh, I was um, uh, almost bewildered. Uh, but then I thought that th there is something that science fiction writers do and uh, uh, what uh, good scenario planners do and that is whether or not they believe that a particular scenario was a likely one or not. Um, good science fiction writers and good scenario planners uh, think about alternatives to their scenarios. So it's in that spirit that I um, am approaching uh, this talk. By the way, I'm also making one other assumption, and that is that uh, we don't figure it out how to get faster than light space travel. Um, just for the sake of people who are are surfing in on this talk, perhaps later on the web, out of context. I want to make it clear that I still regard the singularity uh, 
as the most likely non-catastrophic outcome for our near future. Um, there are perhaps ways of stopping the singularity, but the only surefire ways I know of would be to blow up the world, you know, uh, before, we, before we make it happen. There are all sorts of plausible catastrophic scenarios about this century. Uh, and I recommend uh, Martin Rees's Our Final Hour for um, some insight into those. For the most part, I'll try to steer clear of, uh, uh, you know, final blackout type uh, uh, scenarios here. Uh, in, in their own way, those are uh, as uh, 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 unusable for scenario planners as um, are the scenarios that involve uh, uh, the, the, the singularity, although in, in a much more pessimistic way. Um, so I want to talk about uh, a, a scenario that uh, hopefully is, is, is uh, not one of the catastrophic ones and that for some reason does not have the singularity uh, in it. And so uh, I've uh, come up with a, uh, the beginning of this scenario is, is how the lack of the singularity or the singularity fail, failure might, might, might uh, appear. Um, so I have a bunch of symptoms here, which is a common thing that's done in scenario planning. Um, in fact, one of the more important things is to think about the symptoms that might happen if the scenario was going to go uh, in, uh, in, in some particular way. Um, and the particular reason, probably not, not um, pointed to uh, definitively until after the fact, you know, 50 years from now when you have to write an essay why it was obvious all along that singularity uh, 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 couldn't happen, that sort of thing. Uh, I come up with these um, prospective symptoms. Um, in this scenario, uh, we never really figure out how to put the parts together um, we get the hardware power, but we never figure it out how to put the parts together. If you were of a more mystical bench, you might say we never found the soul in the hardware. Uh, as the years progress, the symptoms for such a, uh, a, a scenario might be that software creation continued to be the province of software engineering. Uh, you know, using Java to solve or to try to solve ever vaster problems, uh, ever vaster, right, ever vaster software projects. and finding that software projects uh, are, 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 are failing in very, very spectac spectacular ways. Um, already, software failures are, are, are really strange and interesting things, large, large ones. Um, many large project failures, if you have a government budget, you just can keep throwing money at it to the point where you can eventually, eventually proclaim um, uh, some sort of victory. Um, there have been software failures that have been so large that even though the entities th that were funding them had deep pockets, in the end they really just had to give up and walk away and say, yep, <laughs> we, we weren't able to make it work. Um, and um, that by itself is, is an interestingly large class of failure. Some of these failures also might be interesting in other ways. Uh, and that is, if the people who always claim, uh, say these terrible things about uh, uh, the limitations of computer programs, in, in this world where everything stays software engineering, I could imagine some very peculiar failures, especially in large automation projects, where uh, large control projects where people attempt total automation. Uh, you could imagine human flight controllers, they occasionally make mistakes that cause aircraft to run into each other. I could imagine a bug in a fully automatic air traffic controller that could actually cause an N-way crash, which is, you know, that's really superhuman in a certain way. Um, so anyway, if, if, we, if we generally got uh, such an era where the largest of these uh, automation projects uh, failed, um, one might actually imagine um, manufacturers backing away from their improvement schedules, which is really what makes, in an economic sense, is, 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 the, is the step that, it, where the a actual uh, slope of Moore's law for the next year or two is determined. And if that happened, we might actually see a failure of Moore's law that wasn't so much because it couldn't been, be done, but just because some of the economic drive for it being done had been, um, had, 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 had been removed by the failure of, of, of software engineering. Um, if that happened, then one could imagine eventually the basic research 
uh, would itself also level off, both, both because of funding, uh, lack of funding, and also because uh, of uh, failure to have the hardware that could support the type of research that uh, uh, would uh, um, push hardware project uh, uh, further along. Uh, so what you might get is a situation where hardware improvements continued for the longest time on the simplest forms of, um, of hardware, where structures are very regular, um, uh, things like uh, large memory systems, stuff like that. And in the end, we have some extraordinarily good audiovisual entertainment products. <laughs> um, nothing post-singular. And some very, very, very large databases, but without software to properly exploit them. If this was how things actually worked out, it w most people would probably not be surprised in that case if the power of strong AI, the promise of strong AI uh, was not fulfilled. And in the same circumstances, there actually are other associated things that m many of us hope f for, like nanotech general assemblers and stuff like that, that also pr probably also elude uh, uh, development. So it's not surprising that uh, Altogether, the early years of this time uh, would come to be called the age of failed dreams. Um, I want to talk about the, the characteristics outside of these sort of technical characteristics of this uh, uh, age of uh, failed dreams. By the way, uh, about a year ago, I, I brought uh, this sort of general notion up with Hans Morvec, uh, talking to him about the possibility that, uh, uh, you know, what if the singular didn't happen? He had a very interesting reaction. He was, he said, that would be so remarkable. I mean, something that is obviously so inevitable. If it didn't happen, my God, that might be the most interesting thing of all, <laughs> um, to try to figure out why it didn't happen. Some fundamental thing about the universe was not, uh, not the way we uh, had thought it obviously was. Well, um, I don't, I, I, I don't go there in this, I just say we have those symptoms. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, the, uh, the people who have been so enthusiastic about this uh, get old, and, uh, and uh, they're the old farts, and it's, uh, it's, it's clearly passe, you know, they're, where's, where's the singularity? Um, on the other hand, some of the consequences of the situation might seem comforting. There's a thing called Edelson's Law. It says the number of important insights that are not being made is increasing exponentially with time. <laughs> um, and actually, I see this as uh, j just e evidence of what happens if, if you're trying to confront the production of information, and in some cases, something like knowledge, with a merely human minds that you will see something like Adelson's Law. Well, if, if these uh, trends actually slow down, uh, then one could imagine that there would be uh, time for us to begin uh, to catch up. Although in some cases, uh, such as just the accumulation of, of bioscience or molecular biology information, you know, about metabolic pathways and, and genomics and comparative genomics and stuff like that, um, the databases could, would probably continue to fill faster and faster, and we would, we would just uh, be falling further and further behind, which actually would fit with the, with the notion of us remaining eternally clueless about uh, some fundamental uh, understanding of how things go. Uh, there's also the possibility that might warm the cockles of some software managers, and that is um, if things slow down on the hardware front, then finally we could go back and do all that crummy software right. Uh, I really don't think that would happen. In, in, uh, uh, although in the long run, if we're talking about thousands of years, this is getting ahead of myself, but in the long run, I think probably in the fullness of time, there would be people who would try it. You could imagine if you were given several centuries, you might be able to redo all the legacy software. Um, and my prediction is that all that does is set up, an, uh, set up a new layer in the midden pile upon which you will uh, uh, you will pile still more garbage, and uh, in centuries later, they will go back and, and maybe, if they're foolish enough, think about trying to rationalize that. Um, less comforting is that I think 
in this scenario that I'm talking about, humanity's chances for surviving the century would actually be more dubious than they would be otherwise. Uh, our environmental uh, uh, threats that people are talking about so much, they would still exist. And um, to me, actually more serious, are warfare threats. Um, nowadays, uh, we are, mo most of us, I think properly so, are terrified by the notion of nuclear terrorism against cities. But compare that to what happened, say, or what didn't happen, between 1970 and 1990, when there were nation states who were talking about exploding tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, many of them over cities, in a space of a few days, in sort of a cooperative endeavor uh, to wipe everybody out. Um, a return to mutually assured destruction type schemes, it seems to me, is entirely plausible, and it is something that goes hand in hand with whatever um, external or environmental issues are, are, are going on. Environmental problems that might merely cause a lot of misery, if they are hooked up with national interests that actually are attached to military machines, um, of, uh, especially of a sort that are involved mutual uh, assured destruction schemes, that's really a plausible civilization killer. Um, I want to talk about envisioning various possibilities for the long now that would stretch out after the age of uh, failed dreams. Um, so I'm going to assume that uh, somehow we managed to survive the, uh, uh, the 21st uh, uh, century. And we're now in a position uh, to talk about things happening over a, a very long period of time. And I want to talk about some, some scenarios um, that, that actually cover a lot of different possibilities. Uh, and uh, I, I, have, I have two or three you know, separate little diagrams for the, for the different scenarios. Uh, typically in diagrams like this, you see people who graph something like population um, uh, as a function of time. Uh, but what I want to do is to graph um, some aspect of technology as um, at, at the relationship of it to population size. And uh, uh, here's, here's an example uh, of the sort of plot. This is, this is uh, for the situation uh, in, 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 our, in our world up to the present time. Situation so far, all of these pictures are going to be our long now on Earth. Well, this looks like a lot of pictures I've drawn over the years for the singularity, right? And a lot of pictures you've probably seen for the singularity. You notice how steep things are getting to the right? If you look at actually the, what's, what are the axes, uh, this is not a diagram of the sort that, uh, 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 that is advertising some uh, imminent uh, singular sort of event. And so I want to talk about the axes a little bit. Um, First of all, time is not explicit in the axes. The horizontal axis is population size. It's not time, it's population size. The vertical axis, I wanted it to be some aspect of technology. And so, you know, I thought about that. Actually, I thought about it too much, maybe. I said, maybe, maybe I could graph the total effluent or the effluent per person or something like that, have that be the vertical. But there's several reasons for not doing that. One is it would have been too hard for me to research numbers. So, in the end, I decided to just go for maximum power source, and by that I, I mean almo almost in a definite way, um, uh, as a discrete power source, what is the maximum um, uh, power source that, uh, that uh, uh, was available um, to uh, uh, our civilization when its size was a size indicated by population number on the horizontal axis. So if I, if I had if I had really good, you know, perfect knowledge of the past, the way to generate this to curve would be to just, for every year from 50,000 BC on, for that year, look up and see what was the maximum discrete power source that uh, humans had, uh, uh, had usable access to. So that would give me the, the vertical coordinate of, that, of, of, of a point on the graph, and the horizontal coordinate would be what the human population of the Earth was at that time. And 
as you go along on this graph, I, you know, I spent an afternoon with Wikipedia or, and Google and looked around. And um, one thing you notice about this sort of graph is that it actually can talk about a long period of time. And there are things on the graph that may be separated by quite a distance on the blue line and actually are not very much time. And we'll see more of that later. And there are some places that look quite close that are actually separated by a lot of time. So the, at the lower left, there's 50,000 BC. I didn't try to chase it back further because basically 100,000, 200,000, 300,000, you're beginning to wonder whether you're talking about human beings anymore. Um, but 50,000, I said, okay, we have just, you know, the power of, 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 of a person. Uh, and as they gradually coordinate with each other, maybe more people. Uh, it's sort of a, a matter of humor to talk about dropping big rocks on one's enemies, partly because it's sort of hard for me to work that out in, into units of power. Uh, but I, I decided to put it in there just for the heck of it. If I had it to do over again, I wouldn't have put horses at 6,000 BC. It would have been oxen at about 8,000 BC, which I think would have actually have a little bit more horsepower than horses. Um, you'll notice that as we go along, the, the graph is rising, presumably because we're ganging these devices together, but still into manipulatable units. Uh, one interesting thing is about how, uh, how steady and, ro and, and robust things seem to be. For instance, the Black Death is scarcely a little leftward notch. Uh, it actually did decrease in absolute numbers the population. So that's why I illustrated it, actually, with a little diversion to the left. Um, didn't change the vertical coordinates um, at all. 1850, begin to get nautical steam engines that could give you a megawatt of power. And then right now, or in, in our era, the largest uh, power stations uh, are about 13 gigawatts. Now, it, it, if it isn't clear already, let me go to this upper right-hand corner where things are beginning to look like they're going straight up. Let's suppose that we manage to stabilize civilization. Um, which actually looks like we have a shot at it in the next century. Suppose we manage to stabilize situation, uh, uh, stabilize population, um, and there was still some modest improvement in the size of power stations that we built. Well, in that case, this this graph, the blue, would go straight up. It doesn't mean that anything unknowable has happened. It's just that this is not a graph of a function. It's just the relationship between the maximum available power at a given population size, and you will, in the later diagrams, you'll see think, situations where it actually can, you know, wrap around in various, um, in, in various, uh, in various ways. Um, so I, I like this sort of diagram because it's going to allow me to look at the entire human era from, say, 50,000 years uh, uh, before now to 50,000 years after now. Uh, af after now. In other words, the whole human long now is visible uh, all, uh, all, uh, all, at, all at once, um, which seems sort of appropriate for this sort of a, uh, of, of a venue. Um, now, that was the situation right now. As I say, it doesn't look too exciting. Um, but I want to look at three possibilities or scenarios in their own right for, for this sort of a, a, a situation. Here's the first one. Uh, oh, I said I wasn't going to kill everybody. Uh, so, sorry about that. I, I want to I have one where everybody gets killed. Um, it, it, it illustrates the it illustrates the uh, things about this way of looking at, at uh, the relationship of population and technology. It also illustrates things about uh, where uh, the length of the curve may be misleading. For instance, uh, it looks like we got a little bit beyond the present, and then advice about the dangers of mutually assured destruction um, uh, strategies were not heeded, and, and we got it back into such a, an event, and we had a major spasm type uh, MAD war. And so here on the diagram where it says a single afternoon of madness, this is a, this is a, a, a few hours or maybe a few days that takes the po human population down to about 10 million. And then, since this is, this is an extinction scenario, uh, it might take a little bit longer to push us back uh, uh, 
all the, all the way to um, uh, extinction. Um, I'm, I, it may seem that I have a thing about nuclear warfare. I, actually, nuclear warfare is one of those tried and, not tried and true, but it's one of those, one of those things where uh, there are lots of things known about the devices. They can scale way up, and the thing about MAD is you actually are getting very large numbers of people and very large amounts of resources that are being dedicated to uh, figuring out how to cause this sort of extreme uh, damage. And uh, there is a sort of magical logic about MAD that keeps raising the threshold of acceptable damage uh, and um, to, to le levels of destruction that would, uh, uh, are enormously higher than what people thought about what they were going to do to begin with. So it's hard to think of any threat where our genius is so explicitly aimed at our own destruction. What about other forms of technology being brought in to help kill people off? Um, that, that could be true, too. I mean, uh, uh, it, is, it is sort of interesting to imagine what could be done with diseases if your goal was to really um, uh, make them something that just in particular evaded what the current technology was for curing diseases. Uh, I haven't tried to, tried to think too much about that, but one could imagine that all there. I think. Um, uh, Martin Rees made an interesting point in his uh, uh, book, um, which was he, he was talking about some of, these, some of these existential threats that some people worry about a lot, uh, like gray goo um, or, or, or other things that, that involve a really uh, a technological tour de force to get within shouting distance of being able to do the threat. And his point was that he didn't think you really have to worry about that because basically, Long before you managed to build the technological house of cards that could support these really cool ways of you know, blowing everything up and killing everybody off, long before you get to that level, the mundane versions of, of destruction will probably, by accident or, or malignant intent of some sort or another, uh, they, they will cause disasters that will uh, uh, either wipe everybody out or, or wipe civilization out. So I think that that sort of thing is, uh, 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 I'm concentrating on this one version of it, but that's something to keep in mind, that actually uh, we are in, in a situation where if you put your mind to it, you probably could cause uh, an existential threat uh, uh, to uh, civilization. Uh, so that was the first one, a return to madness. Um, and anybody who's lived through the... Um, era of the fate of the earth, and the T-TAPS report has, has been exposed to all sorts of that stuff like that. I'm actually quite skepti skeptical about these two preceding references, but for the reasons that I've, I talked about while the slide was up on the board, it's something that I think in principle uh, could be as destructive as, uh, as uh, uh, some people have feared in the past. Ah, the next one, the golden age. This is sort of to sort of make up for my cheating on uh, not, blow, not killing everybody. Um, the Golden Age was a, a non-singular scenario where I tried to, you know, be as nice as I could. Um, and uh, here, the first part of the graph is as before. Here you can see it's definitely not a function of population size. I'll have some others where it's obviously not a function of, uh, you know, not a graph that represents a function of power source. Um, we're at the year 2000 or so now, and in this, in this version here, I have uh, what I've labeled a peaceful ascent into a golden age, which l lasts about a thousand years. You'll notice that there is some technological improvement in power sources in that time, and, um, and actually the population falls to about 300, uh, excuse me, to about 3 billion. Um, so this is the sort of world that I think a lot of people would, would kind of uh, hope for, uh, think that it, that it might happen. Um, it means that somehow we managed to avoid um, the existential threats that everybody is, is worrying about. And, and so I think that a, a lot of uh, time and effort um, of the long now, at least in the near term for the long now, is to think how to have this peaceful ascent into a golden age. And I think there actually are a lot of trends that uh, uh, make that uh, plausible. I see a plasticity in the human psyche uh, that, that can actually 
cause large numbers of people to, to uh, behave in very different ways over short periods of time. I think the leveling off of population growth in, in, at, the, at the turn of the century here has been an example of that. That when you give people hope and information and communication, it's amazing how fast they start behaving with a wisdom that exceeds the elites. Uh, and this is something that uh, I, makes me the most optimistic about the present time, that the, govern the, the governments of the largest countries realize that their national wealth depends more than anything on having large numbers of relatively happy, creative, um, communicating, uh, educated people. That's where the wealth is. These governments may still want to go on and play their usual games, but there is that notion that they're going to have to at least create the illusion of, of freedom if they're going to maintain this resource. There's only one problem with that, and that is for them, and that is that once you hook up millions and hundreds of millions of people that are educated and can talk to each other, they develop a, a certain understanding of what's going on, and there are hundreds of thousands, probably millions of them out there that are better educated and smarter than the captains of, uh, 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 of state and the, and the advisors of the captains of state. There is just a complete mismatch of intellectual horsepower there. And so providing the people with the illusion of freedom would, would probably have to generate in a better imitation of freedom than has ever existed in human history. Um, just looking at what such, I, I don't really like the term populism much, but I, I kind of apply it here, it's sort of a new populism. It's a new populism in which the uh, participants in the populism have self-interest, but it is at such a wide, um, it's, it's, it's such a wide horizon, and it's so well informed that it can actually be uh, mistaken for tolerance. Um, and such people working together in large numbers, I think, can produce miraculous things. In 1995, as somebody had told to describe the Wikipedia to me, and told me uh, what it has demonstrably done to date, whatever you may think about the future of Wikipedia, but uh, what it has demonstrably done to date, I would have said, uh, you should take out a pencil and paper in an envelope and do some simple arithmetic when you see this is bullshit. And furthermore, you will see that uh, you, you don't really understand the destructive impulse of people who like to break things that are beautiful. Um, and so I am just so, I am just so happy that um, uh, that, that, to me, this has been a miraculous development, how successful this is. And that's why, although I regard the golden age as, um, as probably too optimistic, because uh, on Earth there are, there, are just there are just dangers and accidents that can happen. It's sort of like having, uh, even, if, even if everybody, or people of goodwill, if they're standing around in a room filled with dynamite of various sorts, it's a dangerous situation. But I, I actually regard this golden age one as it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's not uh, an idle or an impossible dream. It would be something that uh, uh, could happen and figuring out how to make it happen or how to make deviations from this ideal, how to make those deviations less um, uh, 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 destructive and certainly how to avoid extinction, that's a, a, very, a very realistic goal. Uh, the, the part that says a long, good time, um, that's kind of my quirkiness coming out there. I just tried to imagine what would happen after that, after we get down our population down to three billion and we're all having a great time and all of that. There is still the long now out there. Um, so I understand it, Stuart, we're talking at least 10,000 years. Well, 15. I, I, you notice there's this sort of hazy little blob out there at the end of this long, good time? I was thinking that, you know, um, I was going to label it 50,000 because that's, that, and then it goes from minus 50,000 to plus 50,000. Um, that's what I really wanted to say. And I can't any more say what would happen after that than I, than I, than, uh, than I could say w w what does it really mean before 50,000 years ago. No matter how well we do, 50,000 years from now is far enough in the future just looking at biological time and, and, and things like that that even in the happiest scenarios, um, I really wouldn't expect the human race to be, uh, be around as human race after that point. Um, and if you think about it, that's 
what uh, in the 20s and 30s and 40s when people talked about progress and scientific project, progress, they were quite happy to talk about good things like that happening, good, unimaginably good things happening like that way far away. It's only in the late 20th century when people started talking about it, it happening before the audience gets to retirement age <laughs> that all of a sudden everybody gets really nervous uh, about the prospect. So there is no way that I can see uh, that uh, as live as uh, uh, there's, there's no way that I can see that one could expect the long good time for humans on Earth to go on forever. So that's where I put that sort of little hazy. We went on to become something better uh, balloon there uh, uh, at the at the end of this uh, uh, golden age. And you'll notice that um, I also had the population gradually increasing up to, up to actually. Probably I got my logarithms a little bit wrong. It looks, it looks like I got it increasing up to at least a, 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 a 50 or 60 billion uh, on Earth. Um, and I decided to just do that for the, for the fun of it, um, par partly uh, because I've been so impressed by what large population does to things like the Wikipedia, where you, you have experts about topics of arbitrarily uh, uh, precise and specialized nature all talking to each other and, and all being uh, creative. So, I, I kind of felt that perhaps there's an argument that um, having a very large population, if you can keep the other issues and, and a high standard of living, uh, it might actually be quite a, uh, quite a good thing. And so that's what I showed there. In fact, if we're really talking about 50,000 years in the future, on the scale of this diagram, for all we know, these folks actually did some experimentation. Over a period of four or 5,000 years, they might drive it down, as they did here, to three billion. Or maybe they pushed it up to like 60 or 70 billion, and said, oh, that's, too, that's too high. And then, and, and then as sort of a group consensus, it, it brought it back to something that was a little bit lower. It's not really possible to see here, but in such a long now, there would be some uh, room for that sort of um, experimentation. Um, I have actually have, uh, besides the, the trends that, I, that I've talked about that might uh, make such a golden age uh, plausible, I actually have a substantive suggestion that may be a little bit at odds with um, some of the other talks that I've seen uh, in, in the series. And here is the suggestion. Policy suggestion. Don't want you to take this as special pleading. <laughs> the policy suggestion is that um, old people are good for the future of humanity. Young old people are good for the future of humanity. So that prolongevity research may be one of the most important undertakings for the long-term safety of the human race. And when I see most people talk about prolongevity, uh, I think actually Ray Kurzweil has talked about the objections he gets to people talking about prolongevity. Some of the, uh, some of the objections are, are, well, some of the objections are just very foolish, like, well, everybody, Everybody would be senile then. Uh, you know, that's not, the, that's, that's not what prolongevity is meant here. That's why I said young old people. And uh, other people say that um, uh, they, you know, they would just uh, deaden progress. Uh, that, and that actually is very, a very common one. And, and well, who knows? I mean, we, d we don't have any 500-year people admitting to being 500 years old. Uh, we don't have any 500-year-old people who actually are still uh, you know, young and vibrant. We don't know what they would be like. But actually, I think that there is a lot of reason to believe that having a significant percentage of the population that was young and very old would be very, very healthy for the long now. Um, one analogy would be just uh, uh, the, what having very old tribe members did. I think it really helps tribes in the Paleolithic to have members that are very old, you know, like 40 years old. Um, that this gave a scale of understanding about you know, cycles and stuff, personal understanding of what things were like during the last dry season. Um, and I, I see no reason why the same thing wouldn't be true um, on longer scale. At the same time, if one talks about self-interest, it's one thing to have self-interest in one's great, 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 great grandchildren. And it's another thing, and maybe a lot more common to some people, to have a knowledge of, of their own self-interest with the notion that they are going to be around after the next uh, election or the next stock market report or the next 500 years. Um, 
So if we manage to do that, besides having people that have a long perspective on the future, uh, a long prospective view when they think about the future, eventually we would ha have people that actually have a lot of experience about the very far past. And this example sort of undercuts my point, but it, it, you, you, you know the story, there's this old college that says, you know, we tried that in ought four, it didn't work then, and it's not going to work now. And I could imagine that happening in the future, only this guy is not talking about 1904 or 2004, he's talking about the 4000s. Um, and he wouldn't be talking like an old codger either, I mean, he, he, you know, he, he could look like a fairly young guy, and he might be absolutely wrong. But the thing is, in the long now, having people who actually embody the parts of the long now is, uh, uh, it, it seems to me, uh, almost certainly a very uh, positive thing. Well, now we get to the scenario that if we, if we don't get a, a, a singularity, um, a scenario for the long now on Earth that I, I think is in some form the most likely, although I, as with all of these scenarios, I've chosen to make it a, 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 as extreme, uh, you know, to make it be an extreme uh, uh, case. And, and, and I call it the, the uh, wheel of time, which probably gives it away, but... <laughs> now you know what all the white space in that diagram was for. And as I was toiling away with GIMP, you know, and trying to make my little Bezier curves work on this thing. I was sort of imagining as a science fiction writer what each of those tortuous turns must really mean. I mean, there's really a separate story or sequence of stories about each of those. Some of them may have been nuclear wars. Others may, may have been some really bad plague or an environmental thing that got totally out of hand. Uh, and some of that would have changed the actual shape. I generally went for the shape that sort of resonates with a... Uh, uh, a, a rather dramatic loss of population, a fall in technology, and then crawling back up. And so you'll notice that somewhere in the future we, get, we, we have here um, three uh, little turns of the wheel. Now, notice those little turns of the wheel, percentage-wise, are much larger than the Black Death was. If these things happened fast, they would be extraordinary disasters. Uh, even these first little uh, uh, three here. And then something really bad happened. And here you see an excursion that takes us down to a po world population of 10 million and, and, not even, and not even devices as powerful as, as naval, you know, good naval steam engines. That one, I, uh, you can see these guys tried to cl climb back up. What can we know about the amplitude of these cycles? If you look at the diagram, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making statements about how, how far I think the population fell and, and in, in, in a sense, how far the technology fell. But um, how, what would be the amplitude? I don't think anybody knows, although uh, I think it's worth speculating about. Um, and and uh, besides, uh, besides the question of how many people would die and how low technology would go, um, there's, there's the question of how long would it take to track around the, um, the, the, the cycle, and how high you could get once you came back. You notice in these first little turnarounds that each time the population ended up being not quite as big as it was at the maximum before, and, but we got up to higher levels of, of um, uh, power. I don't know that that, that is true. Um, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, there were people like Harrison Brown who wrote The Challenge of Man's Future, who had this theory that uh, once you went through an event like this, that what it took to make technology was an infrastructure that once destroyed could not be rebuilt because we had consumed so much of the resource universe of the world in, in getting there to begin with, and so that if we came back at all, it would be in some crippled state. I, I think that's very untrue. And John McCarthy is here in the audience, and I think he has a website that <laughs> gives all sorts of good, good arguments why it might not be true that, that actually resources can be, uh, can be um, uh, uh, accessed and will exist under, under all sorts of circumstances. It's always seemed to me sort of strange to talk about uh, mineral minerals uh, or ores being harder to access when you have all these cities left over from the last time around. Uh, fossil fuels might be, have, have gone away 
in a way that's counterbalanced by the fact that uh, I think we probably have left more libraries, more accessible libraries than there are dinosaur fossils. Uh, that's not, that's, sure, that's not literally true, but if you look at all the different ways that we have, that we have, uh, that we have saved our information, uh, in some cases deliberately so it could be accessed in the future, in some cases not, but it doesn't matter. A flooded library of paper books um, that, that then froze or dried out or something like that, some of them might be totally destroyed and some of them might be eminently um, uh, uh, resuscitatable. So in this sort of wheel of time scenario, um, your archaeologists in the long haul uh, would be uh, the enduring heroes of civilization. <laughs> in fact, science as such might actually, ex except, except when you get to the, to the top uh, uh, that things go, new science is not being, is, is not being done ex except in, in a very sort of unhappy way, you know, new science that actually turns out to be that the archaeologists just hadn't found that page yet. Um, but we, we actually, without running some experiments, we don't know. Also, we don't know from this diagram really how dreadful this situation uh, is because we don't know the times. Take what happens after this very bad excursion. We almost looks like somebody was trying for a golden age here. Ah, uh, and they didn't quite make it. They got up to here and something bad happened to them. I apparently speculated there was a war because I say dropping big rocks on one's enemies. Um, you know, asteroid sized rocks in this case. But it may have been that we got hit by a big rock or some other sort of disaster. In other words, life on Earth is a dangerous thing. And uh, what happened here, it, we, we may have had a very long, good run here. Maybe it may have been tens of thousands of years. We eventually came to a ba almost came to a bad end. And you, you notice the notation here that we, we almost lost it on that one. But this is the happy, this is wheel of time. So these guys eventually make it back up. So we go round and round like that. And despite the fact that um, there could be thousands of years that are quite good, there, is, there are existential threats here, and there are existential threats that we really don't, uh, uh, we really can't quantify um, because we, we are the uh, only uh, uh, experiment. So, uh, so sir, we, we really don't know much about these cycles, except that I, th I think it's plausible that the worst of them could kill everyone on Earth. So how to deal with the deadliest of uncertainties? If you look at this talk, I keep saying, who knows? No one knows. I don't think anyone really knows uh, you know, the a a answer to a, a, lo a lot of these sorts of questions. And I've made kind of a list here. How dangerous is MAD, really? In fact, MAD got us through the 20th century alive. Oh, that sounds like a good thing. Uh, we, just, we just don't know. What, how much of an existential threat is posed by environmental change? Um, uh, there are some people who think they know, but I'm not sure w w whether I, I, I believe them. How fast we can recover from major uh, catastrophes. Um, how close is technology to becoming so good that instead of talking about nation state madness, that just people who were having a bad hair day could kill everybody? I mean, if you want to talk about really high technology, is that sort of thing. Um, uh, feasible. And then the qu other questions I raise, like having, uh, what, what, is it good to have lots of young, old people? So we really, there's so many of those things that we don't know because we're essentially um, running uh, one experiment. And I actually have this tremendous uh, respect for uh, scenario planning. There is another tool that is wonderful if you have it. And, and that is simply um, broad experience. So um, broad experience means you know, just, just having other people who have, have tried out certain things and can tell you it's a really bad idea. And you may even know people who have been killed because they tried some stupid thing and it got them killed. At a civilization level, the only examples we have com to compare to are examples that are not comparable. That they had nothing like our technology, they had, they had nothing like our communication abilities and, and stuff like that. So they're really not pure examples. And beyond that, there are lots of things about what's safe and what's not safe that you really need hundreds or thousands of examples. The Framingham Heart Study is kind of a good example. 
Uh, there are things about diet and exercise that just watching your parents or your, even your grandparents is not enough to really get an idea of statistically what, how risky certain behaviors are. The Framingham's, a Framingham study can provide that. But how do you get that when you're talking about a situation when you ha where you have only the one case? Now, I think everybody who's been looking at these diagrams and the titles, you notice that the upper right-hand corner of each of the diagrams, it says, um, uh, uh, the long now, our long now on Earth. Well, the obvious thing that I'm leading up to here is that self-sufficient off-Earth settlements um, are our best hope for long-term survival, not of life on Earth, although I will argue that it actually would improve the prospects of our having, having the Golden Age, but for um, the survival of the human race. And I am so pleased that people like, impressive people like Hawking and Dyson and Reese are talking about that, have brought that back to the center of discussion. Uh, and people have been doing that for decades. Uh, Stuart Brand had his a book on the space colonies in the, in the 70s. Um, and having this come back to be at the center of discussion, I think, is actually quite important. And, and I think it's actually very, very important to, in particular, the long now. I also want to say that, again, this is not a way to avoid the singularity. I think if the singularity can happen, it is going to happen. And it would happen in a singularity situation, too, uh, but along with all sorts of other things we don't, don't know about. What are some objections to having, talking about really serious, self-sufficient settlements in space? The first one is, which I, I get very seriously from very serious people, that chasing after safety in space would distract us from solving our life and death problems on Earth. I, you know, I, 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 I think the situation on Earth is sufficiently dangerous that a moral stand on this issue is, uh, you know, against uh, uh, space colonies is, is, is very, very uh, uh, dubious. Uh, Chasing after space assumes the real estate is not already taken. Hmm, that's actually a possibility. Uh, that and the singularity are two of the most important practical mysteries that we face. Um, a real space program would be too dangerous in the short term. Ah, that's one I don't hear very often. I think there's actually some virtue in that. You remember in that last slide, things blew up because people were dropping big rocks <laughs> on their enemies? Uh, a, real, a real space program, meaning cheap access to space, is very close to uh, providing a, 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 a WMD capability. This may be one of those very rare circumstances. Normally, when people talk about things they want to do, they're dangerous in the long term, but there's some gratification in the short term. Here, you have something that might conceive, well, not, uh, that I think is very good for the long term and might add somewhat to risks on the short term. That is kind of a peculiar situation. I don't think the the existential risk is, is that great, but I wanted to put it on the list. And then there are the practical objections. There's no other place in the solar system to support human civilization, and the stars are too far. Well, being a child of 1950s science fiction, I could go on about this for another hour or so, but let me just say, the stars are not uh, too far. Um, even at... Even at um, even at uh, uh, relatively low speeds, uh, if you're a long now type of person. And in fact, I, I thought this was cool. Robert Heinlein had this book, Time for the Stars. He said, the Long Range Foundation is a nonprofit organization that funds expensive long-term projects for the benefit of mankind. So Danny and Stuart are still out there. Um, and uh, I, I, I think this is just a, a, a perfect, uh, a perfect uh, 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 fit. Now, I really, in some ways, as, as far as propaganda, the real thing here is I think that I'm talking about a real space program. Uh, and that's not what we have. Um, uh, I've, uh, the, the, we started with launch costs five to $10,000 a kilogram. As far as I can tell, the vision for space exploration, which is currently the manned uh, space flight initiative of, of, of the administration, still in, is talking about five to $10,000 per kilogram just to low Earth orbit. This is, this makes any talk of humans in space a doubly gold-plated sham. 
for two reasons. One, of course, that it poses pitiful limitations on the delivered payloads. And the other is that it means the payloads themselves have to be so reliable and so compact that they are enormously expensive. Now, I'm addressing this to humans in space, but actually, because I'm, you know, I'm not trying to alienate uh, astrophysicists and uh, other forms of astronomers and stuff like that, but um, I really, the, 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 the astrophysicists, the cosmologists, they've also been mugged by these two, uh, these two gold-plated reasons. First of all, that they, spend en they, they have to spend enormous amounts of money for their projects in space, which then may be defunded at, you know, at, at a political whim. Uh, and the other thing is that if the launch costs were lower, just think, if you're involved in these programs, what you could do with $500 a pound to low Earth orbit, or $500,000 uh, $500, or, or a kilogram to low Earth orbit, what you could do with that. Um, I think in many cases an argument could be made that even with those still relatively high expenses, you could do things like make space telescopes that are cheaper, large ones, that are cheaper than what you could do on the ground. Because at those prices, what you could put in space is stuff that could use things like laser positioning and, 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 and synthetic aperture that would probably be orders of magnitude simpler and cheaper than trying to do that uh, 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 on the ground. So I think it's something even the, even the robot uh, space people should uh, think about, especially the scientists. I am talking about it here just for the, a, a human-based uh, uh, program in space. And that's why um, I think people all through the 20th century, average people understood how important it was in, in, a, in, in a gut way, how important it was to have humanity into space. And I think their, their enthusiasm has been abused. And because I think that getting humankind into space is so important to long-term survival, I would urge that uh, we reject any major humans in space initiative that, that does not have as the prerequisite the goal for much cheaper um, uh, access uh, 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 to space. Well, I think I'll end there. I think this is where the long, a uh, 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 central to, central to uh, serious uh, long now survival of the human race. Thanks. Werner, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, Unlike many of our speakers, you actually spent some time cruising through the previous speakers and the summaries and so on. I, I'm curious what you found there and how any of that uh, connected to what you were talking about tonight. The, um, the, the discussion of prolongevity, I, I, rev I reviewed where I could see of that. Uh, Kevin Kelly's uh, discussion about the future of science that seemed to me tied in with the uh, uh, the, the golden age um, uh, uh, possibilities. Uh, overall, I, I, I see most of them as being very much the sort of planning that one would hope to go into the golden age version. Uh, uh, for instance, the cities, there, you've had two on, city, on, on, on modern cities. Uh, this version that I'm, that I am, I, I, is, is probably, you know, in a way it's, it's it, it is, it is less detail-oriented, and it's more on, on trying to bring uh, space, and in particular, uh, colonization, at interstellar ranges. If you notice, that, that really means you want to have thousands of civilizations, hundreds of civilizations. You want to have separate histories. You want to be able to run Framinghams that are actually about existential civilization issues. Here's a question from Ryan Grant. Where's Ryan Grant? Back there waving. Uh, is surpassing humans well defined? Who can measure what human potential is if much of our automation effort goes into augmenting our capabilities? He points out that all points on an exponential feel the same. Ah, uh, that was pointed out, well, not, not the last part about exponential, but that, that general point was made to be by Hans Moravac in 1983 on a riverboat in Pittsburgh. He says, I, you know, this, this stuff about the singularity, that's cool, I believe it, he said. But then he said, you know, if we're augmenting our intelligence as we go along, and if you are riding, if your intellect is riding that exponential, 
then the events you're talking about, Werner, with a singularity, are not unintelligible at all. And then he pauses, he says, and I intend to ride that exponential. <laughs> so I, I agree with that point. It's, prob it's probably the, the most mellow way of, of looking at the singularity, although, actually, I have, I have at least one friend that says he doesn't trust people. You know, people are no damn good. People, people have hundred, uh, tens of millions of years of bloody baggage they're carrying around back here. He says, I'd much rather trust a, a, a machine, be much more mellow. And in fact, he said, if you're going to give these powers to anybody, there's only one that I would trust. And he patted himself on the, on the chest. Well, there's, yeah, there's a version of, of sort of the Moravex or uh, there's a few of them. They're behind walls of either uh, sort of event horizon. You can't understand what's going on there or, you know, we're being kept from knowing that because it's too dangerous. So Derek Percy, Derek Percy is where? Somewhere out there. Um, how could one best guard against a world like the scenario proposed but with singularity confined to lab situations such as military industrial sites and kept from general knowledge for the indeterminate future? Is, you know, has Wikipedia made that kind of thing impossible now? Or is that the way it might actually go? That only a few get to I think, ride that. Yeah, I, I think actually there's all sorts of different ways to getting to the singularity. In fact, that's one reason why it's a little bit hard for me to talk about the alternatives. Um, that uh, uh, it, the, the, the general people plus networks plus large databases, that's, that's one. The classic AI is, is, is another, which I think is, is, you know, people don't think about very much right now because they have so much spectacular, neat things going on with the internet. But all of these things, uh, and all of the, those two things and several others, I think are quite uh, possible. And, and some of them uh, could originate in, in quite localized uh, uh, ways, in which case the main question is how fast, do, how, how fast is the transition? Seems like a whole lot of things come down to how fast is the transition. Yes, I, I, I characterize the hard takeoffs and soft takeoffs. A soft takeoff is like 20 or 30 years, which is faster than any, it's as fast as any of the transformations we normally talk about. A hard takeoff is 100 hours or so. Uh, and I think 100 hours a transition is quite plausible if one reasons by analogy um, that uh, when humans came along, uh, what was there before um, innovated, but very slowly. Uh, in an afternoon, a human could innovate, uh, a Paleolithic human, could innovate on a scale that would take um, e even, e even evolved adaptation. It, could, it was even maybe a thousand times faster than that. So we don't have much to go on about what post-singular would be like, but I think the notion that it might be very, very fast is plausible. And I call it a hard takeoff because it would be more like an explosion than it would be like progress. Is there any way such a hard takeoff would not be tremendously selective with some folk? I and mean, this is the rapture kind of thing. Oh, uh, yeah, a hard, hard takeoff is more scary to me than a soft takeoff. Mm -hmm. A soft takeoff is, is so long that you could imagine, in fact, that the infrastructure and the whole society that's supporting it is growing along with it. So even if they, in other words, at each stage, they're able to see what the next stage is going to be like, even if they're not quite participating, but in sort of mellowing it and, and getting some consensus about what they want to do and, and being able to correct. They are becoming more powerful themselves, and so they're correcting where things seem to be, seem to be going awry. So a soft takeoff, it's quite plausible to me that it's be quite mellow. A hard takeoff, um, it might turn out to be mellow, but frankly, uh, the scariest hard takeoff would be one that comes in a military arms race, where the, the spies on each side with the Manhattan Project are reacting on a shorter and shorter time scale until you get to the point where they realize by 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, the enemy's going to have it. You know, mm -hmm. end of game. So we have to take some chances to get to, get to it by 735. And as you come down towards something like that, that sounds very scary. Well, there's a couple things that come with pace. One of them is, in, in those fast changes, a hard takeoff, mistakes can cascade. Whereas with um, change that's slow enough to watch itself and make uh, corrections, well put, yeah. mistakes can correct themselves. And so it sounds like a hard takeoff is a real invitation to catastrophe. It, and we don't know what's going on inside of it. You know, there, mm -hmm. might be, there might be entities inside of it that are doing their best to make it, make it be, be good. But yeah, the soft takeoff partakes of, I think, what a lot of people have faith in 
the abilities of society as a whole and smart people in the societies to, to talk things over and, and to, you know, make things, make things uh, correct for where there were misunderstandings. Maybe there's a, a, a moralistic workaround here that could be introduced, which is, it's kind of the deal of, in good armies, the officers always eat after the troops, and they eat what the troops eat. So suppose high-tech people and scientific uh, movers and shakers said, we're not going anywhere if everybody can't come. I think that's hard to enforce. Mm -hmm. But it, no, of course, both enforce and make possible, but like all uh, ethical concerns, it's a, it's a goal. And I think it's, I think it's actually a, a goal that uh, with, with certain amount of effort w would, um, not, not because of any, any regulation or anything, but it, it actually it could come close to attainment just because of the fact that uh, w what I said about the broad nature of the people in general, mm -hmm. uh, that the more that they are plugged in and the more that they are educated and the more that they are participating, that that is, that that is a power for good. So just the, you know, the general spread of cell phones, I think, mm -hmm. has been the, this, this extraordinarily uh, positive thing. Um, that sort of thing, I think, has the effect of doing what, what, what uh, you, 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 you mm -hmm. suggested in general. Having a policy that says we're not going to go forward until we've brought everybody up, I think that is that sort of thing that unless, unless it can be done some, somehow with like what I said about the cell phones, it's not, it's, it's not something that can be acted upon except by stopping and allowing some bad guys maybe to, who, who have no regard for such notions for them to push ahead. Well, I would give a couple already existing examples. One you keep mentioning is Wikipedia, and Jimmy Wales has spoken here to this group, uh, who takes a very strong ethical moral position, which is that all knowledge should be available to all people uh, in all languages for free. And Google has a similar uh, version of that. Well, these are two huge success stories based on basically include everybody or forget it. Oh, I, actually, I don't... I, I agree with everything except your last sentence. Okay. In, in other words... Um, Include the option for everybody. How's that? They, they've created a situation, and, and, and the principle that you related, to me, is, is I don't see how that's connected with the notion we're not going to go forward until we can bring everybody forward. What, it is, what they have done is they've said these things about information should be out there, people should be able to try, and we have the power, not, not by stopping anything, we have the power to give people that power. So it's not, it's not that we're stopping at all. Right, it's a positive statement, yeah. not a negative statement. I agree. Here's a question from Yvonne Burgess, right here. Um, have you considered a scenario where the vertical axis, maximum power source, somehow becomes irrelevant, a non-determinant, it's superseded by some other factor? You're a science fiction writer, yes. writer. what other factor might do that? I, I, had a, I had a hard time with that vertical axis. I, I wanted basically something about technology. Also, I wanted it to be something that I could look up, you know, more or less hard numbers for. Uh, and after about three tries, some of them really gruesome. I, I won't tell you what some of them was. Like. Uh, I came up with, I did tell you about the effluent. I had one that was worse than that. Uh, and I did want a vertical axis that was something to do with technology. So if the question is uh, something that's not related to technology, I think I'd have even greater trouble m making a chart out of it, you know, making any sort of numerical uh, things about it. Something might be something, maybe a level of education, per, uh, uh, you know, the a a average, a average level of education. That would have been a cool one, although I regard that as very close to technology. Uh, here's an invitation to a science fiction plot from Quinn Norton. Where's Quinn Norton? Right over there. Uh, can you see a scene or scenario where some humans go post-singularity, some have an isolated pool of golden age, and the rest are caught in the wheel of time? Can you talk about a world with all three? Uh, space is deep, Captain. Uh, yeah, there certainly could be a world of all three. Um, also, I could imagine a, a very checkerboarded thing uh, if things came down to connectivity, that you could have a situation where the third world, first world divide becomes a matter of meters, um, you know, instead of separate continents. 
And uh, this actually should be a big motivation to, uh, 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 again, to bring everybody forward <laughs> um, because it is a very uh, dangerous situation. Uh, some people, and I think, uh, again, Hans had, had, had the notion of um, uh, a, a plan for a, a soft takeoff in which in the early years, um, the AIs need people a lot. I think they'll always need people actually for, for a very long time, but they need people a lot. And so p basically people didn't pay taxes anymore. Wait, why do AIs need people? Um, people are orthogonally robust. In the same way, in the same We're way. We're orthogonally robust we are and orthogonally AIs are not? No, no, we are orthog mm -hmm. orthogonally robust to them. To them. Uh, oh, I see. So okay. it's sort of like bacteria. We're like yeah, anybody backup? who seriously talks about killing all the bacteria, yeah. I don't like those pesky bacteria or virus, yeah. we're going to kill all of them in this room. You know, that could be done, um, but even if, it, even if it could be done without immediately killing us, it would be very destructive of our interests. So there are, th there are things, uh, I don't think we can pull the plug on the AIs once they happen, but there are disasters that would be much more immediately destructive than them to us, and we are something that can exist when all the phone lines are down. Yeah. Not all of us can exist. I mean, many of us will go away, but we are actually, we are actually a type of creature that can, can live in the wild. Now, there, are, there is infrastructure we need, which is why it's good not to destroy that, but um, uh, we, can, we, we could bring them back from situations where they were totally gone. And so I think, I think a wise uh, AI would, would, uh, would really want uh, to have us, it's not exactly like a backup system, but it is, it's, it's, something, it's something like a, a, a resurrection system. So we need to hustle through the period of stupid AIs <laughs> who, who would find us problematic and get on to the really smart, really wise, really connected AIs who realize that we're the wild type backups. Yeah, like four hours later. <laughs> That'll be one of your weird afternoons that you speak of. <laughs> okay, here's a question from John McCarthy right here. Uh, concerning space, uh, what about other countries? Your uh, critique was pretty much focused on the uh, temporary US dominance. Um, certainly, if we want to look at any sort of longer time horizon, the, the, the particular nations become as, as irrelevant as the particular nations who, you know, brought the United States uh, uh, in, into, into existence. In the short term, uh, I, I, I think there's a, a, a very good chance that uh, one of the most likely ways we are going to get a real space program is, is just military reasons. That, uh, uh, the, 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 the use that the U.S. has made of, of space has, has depended on it being very, very expensive, so expensive that everybody else is priced out of the market and gives us very great powers and many simple solutions. In fact, this made life uh, uh, dangerously too easy from a military perspective because there, there are sort of weak links there. And once you have antagonists that are playing in that same arena, then you begin to get then you then you get begin to get a coevolution or an arms race there, and at that point, being able to hoist large payloads becomes uh, uh, quite important and quite dangerous in the near term. But uh, international competition uh, towards space, if we survived it, might be something that we would look back on from our numerous civilizations across the stars and saying, "Well, yeah, that worked out for the best." Here's a question from Scott. It looks like Nazarian. Um, this is a real science fiction writer's uh, question. Won't the human imagination indefinitely postpone a true singularity because we are endlessly imagining the future of something like it? In other words, instead of bothering to actually create a future, we, it's, it's just as much fun to keep on imagining it. Uh, there are people out there who are trying to make money, though. and. Uh uh, yeah, there's not enough money in science fiction, is that what you're there's saying? There's not enough money in science fiction. There's, <laughs> there are reasons for wanting to do these things that don't really have anything to do with the imagination of, uh, with the imagination of science fiction writers or, or other sorts of, of, uh, of uh, dreamers. I, I think that people don't realize that um, an awful lot of the technological establishment is working uh, diligently uh, toward the singularity. 
Uh, any, any time you have guys talking about human machine interfaces, I don't, I don't mean like this, you know, I just mean like a better GUI, um, or, or wearable computers, or any of, any of these things, or, 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 or higher bandwidth on communications and easier to use, all of this is sort of progressing in, in, in that direction, and it's the sort of thing that can't really be, um, uh, is, is not really recognized by a lot of, a, a lot of those people. Now, I got an um, impression from, by the way, you're the first speaker to give a simultaneous text. <laughs> That's amazing. We were offering this, this big deal is going to come out with these videos, and you have it live <laughs> way ahead of the curve here. Uh, it, it, makes, it makes up for the uh, troglodytic 1970s graphics. <laughs> <laughs> but the sense I got, both from your written and spoken speech, uh, was that environmental issues uh, sounded like including climate change were not huge on your radar. I just don't know. I mean, I said there were a lot of things we don't know. We don't know. Actually, I have opinions about th those things, but I think it's important. That's what I'm probing we, for here. I mean, th there are, there are uh, if you want my opinion, I think it's clear that we are operating on a scale that ca can cause changes in climate. I think it's also clear that the whole process is sort of a dynamically chaotic process. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, the analogy that I use is the whole situation reminds me a little bit about the parable of the, of the blind tribe and their wise man, mm -hmm. a tribe of blind people. And they have this wise man who's also blind. And one morning, he brings them all together into their tiny uh, camp. He says, I have something very important to tell you, my friends. I've thought about this a lot. I'm a wise man. And we are living at the edge of a precipice. Run for your lives. <laughs> uh, so you, you say and, that... And so we have these... We so have, panic about climate change is not the we, right response? We have all sorts of uh, possibly existential threats. We don't know what they are. I think, and I, this doesn't mean we don't think about them, but I'm saying it's certainly uh, the, at, the, at the point that I'm coming at it is no matter how good we are, we are going to have impo imponderable, we are going to have deadly uncertainties. Mm -hmm. Being trapped in a closet as we are, locked in a closet with a lot of people who are not, not necessarily friends of each other, and they're armed with knives, and some of them have hand grenades and machine guns, and some of them are crazy, and then there's environmental things in, in, in that same thing. Um, that's not, that's, that, that by itself is, 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 a, is a prescription for disaster. And so at a higher, at a meta level, the notion that uh, if you're talking about the long now, the thing is to get other running instances at a, at a distance. Broad, broadness of experience, as you say. Well, it sounds like that one of the things you're looking for from the singularity, which you're still pretty much counting on, despite the exploration of tonight of alternatives, is that it is the kind of thing that can make problems like climate change irrelevant. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it puts the stuff in, uh, in, a, in a different stage, and it probably would make that irrelevant. Uh, uh, it's not clear quite all that it would, it would do. So in fact, if, it, if, if this were a policy discussion and we we're trying to decide, should we have a singularity or not, th to me that's an entirely different thing. I don't think we have any choice on that. It may not happen, it may happen. It's not something a committee is going to decide. Um, so from that standpoint, I don't think talking about having a singularity or not having a singularity you know, is a meaningful policy uh, d d discussion. But if it did happen, then talking about how to move up toward it safely Mm -hmm. Watching for symptoms that it is happening and, and trying to make it happen safely, that's, that is reasonable. Um, and what's going, but planning for what's, what you're going to do afterwards is probably, is probably not, not too much you have there, uh, except you could leave notes for your superhuman. Uh. So it's sounding like the accelerating technologies would be best employed for trivial things first, like entertainment. Uh, where if they fail, it's not bad, rather than the first thing you try to do is fix the, uh, the atmosphere I, planet. Uh, I don't think we're going to have that much choice about, about uh, what different people apply these things for. So I... I, I no, yeah, you will, because uh, there's different scales. One person pretty easily can apply it to entertainment. To apply it to the atmosphere would take more than one person. 
And so there's a, a scale and a pace difference that happens even with the same tools, yes? By uh, engaging different scales of problem. I think if, if I were talking about um, policy issues for related to the singularity to make it safer or not, uh, what you just said is, is the category of thing. Uh, I, I think another category of thing is, is talking about stuff that um, might tend to make it be a soft takeoff, talking about things that empower the designers so that they, that they actually are better able to talk about what they are, are, are doing. And I think there's some hope you know, al along those lines. Something that is, would not be good is um, a military AI, um, you know, a secret military AI, AI thing would be especially bad if there was a second secret military AI, AI thing that somebody else was doing. Because they would accelerate each other into oblivion or uh, they would be they would surprise each other in a bad way or what? I, I, I think just as with the Manhattan Project, uh, it would be a sieve at least, uh, and uh, both, ah. both sides would be watching the others very carefully and, and that there would, there would be a type of acceleration there. If I, if I were going to write a nightmare story, that would be the, uh, the, you know, the arms race that, that, that ends at 8.30 tomorrow morning. How possible do you think large-scale secrecy is in the world now and to come? Um, my guess is that it's not very possible at, oh, if you mean, depends on from whom. Um, so, I, 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 I think that there are organizations that will probably be able to keep you and me from knowing what's going on inside those organizations. For how long? Uh, for long enough for it, for it to cause us serious harm. Okay. Um, I, th I think that uh, for those organizations to keep things secret from their peers, may be, may be hard. And, and also, I think it, it, it's, it's also true in a slightly more mellow way, you know, if you, if you, if you what I said about being able to keep the secret, that's a very tight thing. Mm -hmm. at, a, at a larger scale, I think the, uh, one of the more happier things about this madcap rush toward total insidious surveillance is uh, to the extent that we can make it symmetrical, um, it is much less dangerous and it is much less harmful. So I'm actually very, uh, I, I, re I think one of David Brin's greatest contributions has been the Transparent Society stuff. And I realize, yes, I'm, uh, and I realize that uh, for me and I think most people, it, it, at first glance there's this terrible, oh my God, they would know about, you know, fill in the blanks. Right, right. Um, and I think that actually for a few years, if we achieved, really uh, a lot of symmetric uh, knowledge of, of uh, you know, of, of what's going on. Uh, it would be a very bumpy few years. Um, and, then, and then afterwards, it, it would be pretty much the way it is now, except some of the worst villains um, would either be off the map or, or, else they would, they, or else they would be productive citizens. I mean, if they were smart, they would just be productive citizens. It's easier, the shortest path. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because this kind of sort of uh, omniscience, total knowledge, has been in the various religions reserved to God, uh, but not reserved. You know, as a believing whatever, uh, God knows your innermost thoughts, including the icky ones, and you have to deal with that. And now you're proposing a world in which uh, there's no extraterrestrial deity doing this. It is uh, our very own selves knowing each other's innermost thoughts. And what's been pointed out to me is how, in, um, in, in some situations, how, small town situations, how terrible that can be. Mm -hmm. um, one thing about small towns, though, there also are people with deep, dark secrets that no one knows about because they're, you know, they're, they're tied to a bed out in a small cabin you know, in the middle of their farm. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So I, I, I think that actually uh, uh, the, the people who talk, talk about how bad, you know, how bad, they, they talk about the transparency as being illustrated by small towns, I think they are wrong, I th or they, they're right about that. But social-wide transparency, uh, I, I think, would be, would be good because one thing you, that you, besides the things that, that, you know, the terrible thing I just mentioned about somebody, you know, locked away, mm -hmm. it, it, that, that um, if everybody knew it, Actually, you begin you begin to get a certain amount of tolerance because it, at around along the range of thousands and millions of people, there's a lot of stuff going on, and the question really is, what is really intolerable? You decide what other things are intolerable. It becomes a much smaller list. You 
wrote a book recently enough, you probably remember it, uh, called Rainbow's End, yes. in, in which um, various permutations of this kind of transparency and other things are wonderfully played out. Uh, what's your sense of how what goes on in Rainbow's End, which I really recommend to everybody here, uh, relates to what you've been talking about tonight? Oh, Rainbow's End um, was uh, cleverly written so that you can't tell whether it's, whether, so you can debate whether it's on the singularity track or not. Okay. There are several characters in Rainbow's End, in fact there's a spectrum of characters, of greater or lesser superhumanity depending on, on how melodramatic you think the author is, is uh, uh, it, what sort of melodramatic license the author is taking with his fiction. Um, it is where I think things could well be uh, by say 2025 mm -hmm. and uh, if you look at it at, at, from the singularity thing, it is just before things become so seriously strange that nobody can pretend that uh, the singularity is not underway. If you want to say the singularity is not happening there, it's a little bit harder, but it, it would be, it, it illustrates what I was saying about how even if the governments, the governments realize that they have to put up with people because the people are what makes the wealth. Mm -hmm. And this story could be, could be considered to be on the, well into that, where it doesn't, it's, it's actually a rather dystopian statist mm -hmm. story. The thing is, there's all this stuff going on that it doesn't matter. They haven't overthrown the government. They're just saying, you know, you the government, you have your thing, you know, do it. We'll, we'll, we'll pretend like you're running the country. And then there's this other stuff going this on. This is neo-libertarianism, I can just see. <laughs> yeah, crypto-libertarianism. <laughs> <laughs> well, you haven't written the sequel yet. One understands that you might well. Yeah. So uh, you don't have to commit anything by speculating where you might go with a sequel to Rainbow's End. I should uh, suggest that in Rainbow's End, there are a couple of characters who one starts to suspect by the end of the book uh, may well be AIs who be live on the net and are pretending to be humans. What happens next? Yes, you have you've illustrated the problem with writing a story that has all sorts of intriguing things like that. Uh, topping, topping that or showing where it was going would, is, is going to be very hard. Actually, I do really have some ideas. Uh, uh, and Try them out. Pardon? Uh, there are multiple scenarios. You don't have to commit yeah, oh to Yeah, any, okay. Right? One multiple scenario is I, I, I think that it, we may find that um, there is room for different sorts of intelligence. And if you look at the story, there are actually different sorts of possibly superhuman intelligence. In fact, there's different sorts of intelligence that may not be at human level like the mice. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it, it would be kind of cool if what you got uh, uh, in, into the singularity was a, a whole group of different uh, things, some, some of them more physically powerful, some of them faster acting, some of them slower acting, and some of them may be subhuman, but they're getting better, and they have their claws near the infrastructure. Uh, and that I, I really think that um, uh, one thing that you might see in such an era is a departure from uh, the genetically self-interested, you know, forms of xenophobia and a genocide. Uh, genocide is, I guess, not, not quite the right word when in, in evolution, but that we've had in the past. That when it comes down to uh, things that are advanced in us, so that it's just the mode of thought and preserving the mode of thought and taking the parts that are good and using those modes of thought for later structures. When it gets up to that level, uh, I, I think we might see uh, the, what is it, nature bloody in tooth and claw. We might see that sort of mellow out because that's really not important. That, that in fact is just the metazoan message about evolution that involves having very high threshold between critters that are competing and you eat them up or you cut their throats or, your, or whatever and that's how you advance. If the thresholds between uh, identity and consciousness get to be lower, then I think the whole situation with comp competition becomes much more of a, of a, of a lateral thing. And, well, and more much, like and, bacteria. Yeah, more like bacteria, except still there's perhaps more hierarchy, more hierarchy possible than uh, there is hierarchy with bacteria, but m more hierarchy than is generally associated with bacteria. Uh, the reason I bring up bacteria is Kevin Kelly and Paul Hawken and I have been uh, discussing uh, horizontal gene transfer, which yep. uh, is much uh, despised by my fellow environmentalists, and I think it's just swell because bacteria do it all the time. And in fact, we're now getting why do environmentalists transfer uh, between kingdoms? And 
So, you know, intellectually, that'll probably be the case as well. Here's a question without a name um, relating to Teilhard de Chardin, uh, whose omega point uh, involves basically an ultimate human convergence evolution to a real religious and conscious breakthrough. It's a kind of a singularity, and your vision seems to focus mainly on technology. How do those relate, if at all? Oh, I think they probably do relate. I, 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 there's a lot of things growing up that I only that I really wasn't aware of, but I was the fish. But I was a fish swimming in the water of those ideas. Um, Talhard was a guy that I actually never read his stuff, but I was very aware of it. You know, in in the popular stuff in the 1950s and, and reading about it, and I thought it was seriously cool. Um, and, so, and so did my mother. She brought me up on Talhard. You know? and, uh, yeah, and so I was thinking, there must be some way that this can all make technological sense, you know. And, uh -huh. yep. Well, with the Omega Point in view and uh, dinner time approaching, I think we've had an evening of it. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you.